Okay, so uh, Peter, for anyone who may not actually be familiar with uh, your work and what you do, could you just give us a little bit of information about your life and uh, your career path? How did you actually get into philosophy and how did you end up into the philosophy of psychedelics specifically? Okay. Um, well, I um, I was always interested in philosophy as a, as a child. Um, I was known as the little philosopher. And... Uh, <laughs> My father had a number of books on Eastern philosophy, um, the philosophy of yoga, from yoga, really, Nani yoga, okay. and so on. So I had that in my house, and um, when it came to um, possibly going to university, I, I wanted to study Eastern philosophy, but it wasn't really available in Britain at the time. Mm -hmm. So I uh, chose Western philosophy, which is as close as it got. Um, <clears throat> but then I really got into that, and... Um, and so I studied that. I continued with a master's degree in it. Um, mm -hmm. After that, I did a little stunt in in London where I uh, worked for the music industry for one and a half years. Um, because, I, yeah, just because um, my master's degree dissertation was on Kant and Schelling. And it was, you know, in order to get it in on time, I, I was working 10 hours a day for two months nonstop, you know, without Ooh, a weekend okay. or whatever. After that, I was just sick and tired of philosophy, you know, so I sort of had a, <laughs> had a, I just thought, yeah, no, I'll get into the music industry instead. Um, anyway, so I, yeah, I got into Warner Music there for one and a half years, but, you know, philosophy kind of uh, creeps creeps back into your life quite easily. Uh, I think mm -hmm. once you've got the sort of taste for it, it you'll never lose it. So then I, um, I found a job teaching um, philosophy in London in a, in an A-level college in South Kensington, in, in central London. Um, so I taught, I taught then um, A-level. If you don't know what that means, in, in Britain, A-levels are the uh, um, qualifications you do before, just before university, so usually for 16 to 18-year-olds. Mm -hmm. So I taught that for six years in London. Um, and I always wanted to continue with a PhD in it, but... Uh, but half of my colleagues had PhDs and they were on the same salary as me doing the same thing. So I thought, well, what's the point really? So, so it was an easy, easy life in a way. Um, but, um, oh yeah, there I was roped into teaching theology as well, or philosophy of religion. And uh, this sort of links to psychedelics a bit, I suppose, because there were part of the course was teaching... Um, teaching uh, students the arguments for God, you know, the classics, ontological arguments, teleological, cosmological, and so on. Um, okay. all, all, all of They were mostly rational arguments, so they had sort of rational uh, comebacks. But there's one argument, which was the argument from experience, sort of mystical experience, that wasn't a rational argument, so you couldn't use reason against it. Um, and uh, that always interested me, and then I linked to that, I read William James, The Varieties of Religious Experience, and, um, of course, William James writes about what we could just about call psychedelics, you know, ether, nitrous oxide. And he even said, I later found out, he said, you know, to understand Hegel, you should really take nitrous oxide. <laughs> but okay. anyway, so that that got me interested. In, and then um, eventually I uh, that, that sort of was the trigger for me getting into psychedelics later on. But um, but then, yeah, no, I, I then I um, met... Uh, uh, what became my my wife, German wife, and then we moved back to Cornwall, where I was brought up um, with a son, and um, and then I I got back into philosophical academia by joining Exeter University, where I am now, where I am um, where I'm doing a PhD on panpsychism, the notion that okay. mind is universal, and um, and I also teach there um, logic and uh, metaphysics and whatnot. And that, yeah, and I suppose that that sums up where I am now. Okay. Do you actually remember your first? What, do you do you remember the day where you actually sat down and was like, okay, this is it. I'm actually going to take psychedelics. <laughs> and what was what was the process like? What was going through your head? And did you did you take any notes before and after, or how did that experience go for you? Um, yes, I do remember. Um, okay. It's a strange one. The reason. I think once you asked me in that written interview we did um, why mm -hmm. philosophy and psychedelics had never really taken off like psychology had with it. And um, yeah. I think one reason philosophers are really scared of doing psychedelics is because, you know, the mind is their tool of trade and they don't want to mess with yes. it. And um, I mean, they think I think most people <laughs> think it, they are more dangerous than they actually are. <laughs> so I was wary of that as well. Um, 
But I did a lot of research into it and a lot of reading of William James um, and other people. Um, A.J. Eyre even wrote about the mystical experience and the logic behind it and so on. Did a lot of research into philosophy, but also into the uh, into the actual substances. And then what happened is uh, one day I was walking in this uh, field in Cornwall, and mm -hmm. uh, my brother with my brother, my brother s s spotted these mushrooms, and he said, "I think Peter, they are uh, magic mushrooms." And I said, "Really? You know, I didn't really know at the time, but there were many. You know, subsequently I never found as many in my life. You know, <laughs> but there was there was a whole load there." And I thought, okay, I'll pick them and I'll take them back and I'll sort of um, check online to see if they are actually the, the magic mushrooms he was speaking of. And um, did a lot of research and they were. And so I kept them. And then a week later, I tried a small dose, and uh, which was pretty, pretty fantastic. But it was very, you know, small dose, like a 25 Liberty caps or so. And um, a, week, a week or two later, I took um, a higher dose. And that's when I realized that that sort of, you know, changed my life you know, um, because of its its power. OK, before we actually get back into the experience, uh, let's backtrack just a little bit. What were your religious views before you actually before this experience happened? Did you have any at all? Uh, not really. No, I mean, I'm uh, I'm half Swedish, half British. And uh, Sweden okay. is the most secular country in Europe and the Czech mm -hmm. Republic. And where I live in Cornwall, which is southwest Britain, um, it's pretty secular as well. So I was just brought up in a, and my parents were secular. My mother always said she believed in something. And my, like I said, my father was interested in Eastern mysticism. But mm -hmm. um, I was never, I would never call myself religious. In fact, I was quite, I suppose, you know, like 10 years ago, I'm 37 now, but 10 years mm -hmm. ago, so I was pretty atheist, really. I mean, I, I still, you know, have that tag, I suppose. Okay. Um, yeah, so non-religious, if not you know, militant atheist almost. Okay. It's always interesting to me whenever people take psychedelics that are, that come from a secular background, because then we can really see uh, the potentiality that these substances mm. have, because you don't have any, you don't really have any stake in what happens. No. Um, it's just an interesting experience for the most part. I mean, it you, you take them, I think most intellectually curious people take them for the expansion, but there's no religious backing behind them. So that's mm. always interesting to hear someone secular uh, take them. But after you, so now that we know that you're secular going into this, what happened? What did you see? <laughs> well, it was, um, it was, uh, it was awe-inspiring. I mean, I'd okay. say awesome, but it's an overused word, but it was uh, <laughs> literally awesome. So it was, uh, I mean, so many things happened. I mean, it lasted a few hours, but I... The general impression I have is of sort of traveling through some kind of strange space, cosmos. Um, mm -hmm. I remember one point I sort of sort of saw this giant uh, sort of glass looking rose spaceship, which was sort of unfurling, um, oh. which was sent. I felt was sentient as well, you know, sort of had a consciousness. Mm -hmm. At another point, I saw another spaceship and I sort of slowly went inside. And as I got inside the spacecraft well I, I say spaceship you know it's the closest word we have um yeah, yeah. i remember there was like in the center of the spacecraft a glass like cylinder with some columns around it you know as detailed as the room around you now you know very immaculate detail mm -hmm. and i slowly sort of traveled into that cylinder and as i got into it then everything changed again and i can't remember what happened after that but these kind of things i remember like meeting aliens and thinking ah that's this is how we should be contacting aliens not through SETI but through uh, psychedelics or something like this you know um yeah but then other other a lot of gothic things as well you know like dark dark uh what a lot of people would probably call you know like a sort of bad trip or a dark trip you know like um yeah. a huge kind of devil figure who uh who sort of I became and then he became me uh you know it's odd hard to explain but all of these experiences were unbelievably um aesthetic um and also the emotions involved i remember having emotions or feelings for which there exists no words because people don't generally have them but and i can i can hardly remember them but i do remember that thinking to myself these are you know um states of mind or emotions that i've never had before and i didn't even know were possible it's a bit like uh, maybe experiencing the consciousness of another animal, you know, 
I mean, there's a famous um, philosophical essay by Thomas Nagel, what is it like to be a bat? You know, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and taking psychedelics, I mean, it, I don't think it answers that question, but it, it gives you a completely different form of consciousness. So, and that's, to me, why the, the sort of this form of consciousness, psychedelic consciousness, is so, uh, you know, there's so much to exploit from philosophy there. There's so much to give. Um, I mean, I know you probably get this question all the time, but what what exactly do you think is happening? I mean, do you do, there are some people who don't think that these are actual spaces, that they don't believe that this is that this stuff is real on any sort of dimensional plane or anything like that. And it's just, um, I guess, manifestations of the subconscious, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. But in your opinion, what do you actually believe is going on here? I mean, on this topic of what we call uh, veridicality, um, objective mm -hmm. reality. I'm, I'm agnostic. I mean, I really don't know. Um, okay. I, uh, I mean, my late, I had a, an article out recently in a journal which argues that you, you can, um, you can see certain visions as an access to an eternal realm of, uh, of forms or uh, universals. You know, um, yeah. you know, Plato, Plato, of course, famous for it. Pythagoras before him, but. I mean, you know, Bertrand Russell argued for this existence, this atemporal, non-temporal, eternal realm of existence, um, which ingresses into our general perception, you know, and um, mm -hmm. and uh, and Santayana calls it essences, Russell calls it universals, Plato calls it forms, uh, Whitehead calls it eternal uh, objects, but usually we, we only see a fraction of that eternal realm, but I... But I, you know, I speculate whether on psychedelics you suddenly get a huge access to this world. I mean, yeah. an another example there, like the form of the be form of beauty, which uh, Plato spoke about a lot. I mean, I remember having one trip where I was sort of just constantly going through these sort of visions, and then every now and again, boom, you know, the the most beautiful, perfect object, you know. Yeah. I mean, even one of them was even like a sort of kind of transformer robot thing, you know. <laughs> But it was just so unbelievably uh, perfect in its uh, form, you know, uh, that you think you're having sort of um, sort of access to this realm here, perhaps. But like, a, but the but these issues are impossible to prove in any way. I mean, it can't. The the relation of the brain to the mind, of course, is completely unknown. I mean, yeah. Colin McGinn says we don't even know what a solution would look like, you know, um, to that, that question of as to how the mind and the brain are related. All, all we know are correlations, but we, we haven't got explanations. So, you know, before you can really talk about the sort of uh, truth of psychedelics, I think you need to realise the truth behind the mind matter um, world not, as Schopenhauer calls it. So it's complicated, you know, it gets very deep, but... Um, I, th I think uh, you have to be humble in, in, in front of this issue. That's, um, I mean, like philosophy for the most part is sort of the search for truth, you know, for for an individual truth. Or um, that's why it's always been kind of weird that people aren't as on board with psychedelics in philosophy as you would think they would be, especially since a lot of Greek philosophies, as you mentioned earlier, it seems to have a lot of mm. psychedelic connotations. Mm. Um, yeah. So it, it's always been strange to me that it's never been that it didn't transfer over. I mean, I, I remember reading that the uh, that um, a lot of Greek philosophers and uh, aristocrats used to take the uh, journey to Eleusis and they take the Kaikion. Yeah. Which was, you know, a murky psychedelic brew. We still don't really know exactly what it was. But yeah. We it could have it was obviously some sort of psychedelic brew. Um, yeah. Well, most, most people believe that it was i mean albert hoffman yeah. famously you know had this theory about ergot you know from the mm -hmm. um, from the, the neighboring field um the bar the barley field um but it's not i mean it's it's hard to establish but it seems very likely and when you read yeah. um you know plato sometimes he talks about you know um, partaking in the mysteries and um uh, seeing visions of the most uh, uh holy sort and so on you know so I think it, it's it's more likely than not that they did partake of this, but of course for them it was an annual thing. It wasn't it wasn't recreation. Yeah. It was a very serious mm -hmm. thing for them, which they had. To, I mean, it was called the mysteries. You had to keep it secret. And there's a yeah. case. 
I mean, another another reason why it pro most probably was a psychedelic substance was because there was a case where an aristocratic youth um, partook of the mysteries at his home, I believe, which means he must have sort of taken the uh, the um, the chemical there. But it also shows the fact that it was taken so seriously because he was arrested and so on. Why, why do you think it was taken so so seriously? Why do you think they just didn't want the general public to get a hold of this stuff? Um, I don't, I, I don't know really. I mean, um, I suppose the experience itself is. I mean, we in our culture today we think of psychedelics as recreation. You know, something sort of mm -hmm. um, because we combine it, we think of them in combination with like party drugs, you know, cocaine and whatnot. Yeah. But um, but really, they are of a completely different sort, you know, and uh, it's just the word drug which puts them together. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, if, you, if you're if you on a heavy dosed, uh, silent, you know, LSD trip or whatever, you know, it's not, of course, a party drug. You, c you can hardly communicate. And um, and yeah, you see you see things which are, com are very unusual, rare, and you get the actual feeling of sublimity you know the sublime yeah. you get that feeling of importance there well at least you can you off, i often do so that i suppose the the experience itself lends itself to being taken seriously but um yeah why they took it so seriously i, I don't know i mean it could be a yeah. number of cultural reasons as well that's actually very very interesting because it, it just didn't seem to translate over i mean um i, I remember reading hegel myself and thinking like the the veil guy seems like a very 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 psychedelic concept because it's kind of the world spirit seems like this sort of all is one type of interconnected um philosophy mm. and mm -hmm. how how anyone would well i mean I, I, it's not impossible to conceptualize it without psychedelics i'm not gonna make that assertion but it just seems like there was definitely some chemical aid and and i actually didn't know that you said um that william, someone said uh william james you know, yeah james said to you know to understand it you need either yeah, so that makes yeah. nitrous oxide. Sense. Yeah, yeah. He said. Well, he, he said. You know. Um, yeah. He had uh, when he had taken nitrous oxide. Um, Hegelianism suddenly made total perfect sense to him. You know. So, um, so there is that. I mean, I did look at the uh, possible use of um, psychoactive drugs from the great philosophers. I didn't find anything on Hegel, but of course, opium was common at the time, and opium can induce uh, what we'd call psychedelic visions. You know. Mm -hmm. in the right circumstances. I mean, yeah, there's Hegel, but I mean, Schopenhauer, who was his contemporary, the critic of Hegel, I mean, he's got this idea of, um, this kind of um, idea that ultimately everything is one and um, division is just a phenomenal uh, thing which is not real. And mm -hmm. uh, so I think his philosophy really lends itself nicely to psychedelics, more, probably more than Hegel's. I mean, I know, I know more about Schopenhauer than Hegel, though. But um, of course, with shop now you got the pessimism, which uh, doesn't yeah, really fit in nicely. So. But then again, I mean, psychedelics, I suppose, could could induce some kind of um, existential angst. I um, I remember I had a student once in London. Um, mm -hmm. He was a he was a, he, he did philosophy of religion with me. But he was a before before he ca came to study um, that he was a sort mm -hmm. of happy go lucky sporty kind of you know guy. And he told me he had this, um, he took uh, what he thought was ecstasy. And when he went home, he f he went to sleep and then suddenly he woke up and he was in the corner of his room, you know, on the roof, looking down at his body. And uh, that completely changed him. You know, he didn't know what to make of it. He went quiet for a year or so, he said. And then eventually, you know, he met me. <laughs> so, and then we discussed. <laughs> and actually, we went through William James and his notions of the, you know, the... Um, mystical and so on so yeah it certainly can have this effect on people okay um i've heard i've heard tons about william james especially through reading huxley but i've never actually um read any of his work myself could you just kind of break down what his main sort of uh, concepts were um <clears throat> yeah well interestingly with william i mean first of all he's a great great philosopher um psychologist he was also a medical uh, doctor but he uh, he lived about 100 years ago, and um, he's mostly famous for pragmatism, which is just the view that um, truth, uh, very briefly, like truth is what works, um, as opposed to some absolute thing, which hasn't really gone down that well. But, but he wasn't, Whitehead said he's a great source for interesting 
ideas, but James himself never really came up with a philosophical system. He, he was just uh-huh. very good at analysing other systems and um, concepts and so on. Like there's a great, great essay by him called um, "Does Consciousness Exist?" For example, mm-hmm. um, but where he ended up and where I use him in my PhD now is that he ultimately became a panpsychist, combining the thoughts of uh, Gustav Fechner, um, who was an earlier panpsychist, and then and uh, Henri Bergson. And actually, in a book called The Pluralistic Universe, he also combines Hegel into that, yeah. And by combining those three, he comes up with this theory of, uh, this panpsychist theory that everything is conscious, um, from human organism down to an atom and beyond, but also following Fechner upwards, you know, so you've got sort of uh, planetary consciousnesses and so on. Um, Not in any kind of wishy-washy way, Um, Mm. you know, very, very analysed, very thoughtful, final thought to his philosophical career it, but he ultimately also came up came to the conclusion that the human intellect is just not powerful enough to be able to comprehend the truth of these matters um, which is not quite giving into faith but its logic l- led him so far and after that he he realized that um, it wasn't enough and therefore, the most plausible explanation of reality was this this general panpsychism. Okay, how does panpsychism differ from solipsism? What are the, the main differences there? Um, well, solipsism then is generally the view that you only know that your own mind exists. And, uh, and that's it. I mean, like, maybe the whole world is just part of your imagination. Mm-hmm. Um, Panpsychism is the view that is almost the almost the opposite, but it's also very similar in the sense that yeah, every yeah. everything is mind, but not your mind, right? So, um, <laughs> so it's the belief that not only do other people have consciousness and exist physically, but okay. even atoms have a form of sentience, not consciousness necessarily. So, not um, memories and uh, thoughts about the future and what they did last weekend together. But um, mm-hmm. just uh, basic forms of uh, maybe something analogous to desire or fear or something like this. Okay, that's trippy. So it would yeah. be like, um, uh, I mean, I guess that would kind of tie into what Huxley said in a way, like the, the reductionist valve theory that we're just all kind of mind at large, basically, and we're just conduits for whatever the mind at large is. Yeah, I mean, it's related to that because Bergson was a sort of panpsychist and um, Huxley's... Va- uh, valve theory came from Bergson, so there's there's a definite link there. Yeah. Okay. Um. So let's go back to actually um, your experiences. So now that we've gotten a little bit more of what the terms mean and the general uh, your areas of interest when it comes to philosophy. Um. Aside from your first, was, would you say that your first experience was your most powerful, or have you since had any experiences that were more uh, beneficial for you? Um. I suppose the first high dose experience was always, you know, the most shocking because yeah. you just realize the potentials of the human mind. So mm-hmm. that, that always stays with you, I suppose. But uh, since then, I've had, I mean, I had an extremely strange salvia divinorum experience, um, oh. <laughs> which was uh, uh, memorable. In it. I mean, OK, quickly, what happened is I, you know, with salvia, it sort of just lasts 10 minutes. And yeah. Um, or so, and uh, <clears throat> so I, I, you smoke this, and then you, f- you forget who you are. It's interesting because on mushrooms, you always, rem- you know, there's always in the back of your mind, one of your minds somewhere, you know, the fact that yeah. who are you. But with salvia, completely forgot, lost my identity. This, you see, this is also interesting in terms of philosophy because there's so much written about the self, you know, what the self is, and so on, bundle theory, blah blah blah. Anyway, forgot who I was. All I knew was that I was on this pink Harbour Street. And at the end of it was a panda woman matron who was sort of taking care of the place. Um, uh, I was on a street in a harbour town. And then I sort of zoomed back and I realised this pink street was one blade, this giant propeller, which was rapidly spinning around. And the other blades were different coloured streets in harbour towns, all of which had a panda matron. Uh, and then one of the street, one of the blades was my room in, in London. 
um, and I sort of uh, felt like I was being asked to go back to that blade, you know, and, I've, and I thought mm-hmm. to myself, no, I, I want to stay here. Uh, <laughs> and then I sort of, and that was pretty much it, you know, um, and then I sort of returned to my room and, and then you just have a sort of um, sweet calm for about 20 minutes and you're back to normal. But that that was a very I mean very different because yeah you lose your sense of self but also just its rapidity its its dynamism it was so fast it mm-hmm. was so extreme that I uh, that stood out as well. Um, but um, I mean I'm also I think you know my parents were both artists painters and um, I've always had that aesthetic element in my life. I mean I'm quite prone to hypnagogic hallucinations as well generally which okay. if you know if you don't if people don't know what it means it's the it's that on the cusp of sleep, you yeah. see uh, visions, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to believe that that was a dream sort of leading into your uh, wakefulness. But on reflection, I realize it's not like a dream because a dream is generally has a narrative. You know, you're walking along a road and then, you know, a, fly, a cow flies by or something like this. But with these yeah. visions, uh, there, there's no narrative. Uh, there, it's more, in a sense, psychedelic because you just see you know, some weird dragon-like figure sort of strolling in or something like this and uh, see these uh, evil faces or whatever it may be. So I think, um, I mean, it's an interesting question. Are, more, are some people more susceptible to visions on psychedelics than others? I suspect they are, and I suspect I'm, I'm highly sensitive to it. But I'm, again, how do you prove this? That's strange. I actually didn't have any um, before I actually took psychedelics. I had very little experience with um, any sort of hypnagogia but when on my way to bed. Like it's it's strange. Like after um, my first experience with LSD, that's when oh, yeah. I started becoming. Yeah, maybe I just never paid attention to them. And since I actually saw them in a waking state, they just kind of stuck with me more. Could be. Um, or maybe something but, was triggered in your uh, in your brain to sort of start that yeah. up. Now. <laughs> but actually, it's interesting you say maybe you never noticed them because you do have to sort of, uh, even though you, you have to be like half asleep, you at the yeah. same time need to be focused on that um, mm-hmm. space, as it were, you know. So often, I think when you lie down just before you fall asleep, you're thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow or whatever. Um, but uh, you have to stop doing that and focus on what you're actually seeing, you know, with your eyes closed. Yeah. And if you can focus on that at the same time you have to be half asleep, then you will see it. So maybe it's always there, but you're not watching. Yeah. This is the old Greek view of dreams. You know, you don't have a dream, you watch a dream. It's kind of Eastern too in that whole just being present. I mean, because after it, I guess mm. I just felt more present after um, right. I've done psychedelics. So I guess if you're more present in, in you're just on your way to bed. You're just going to bed. You're not worrying about the things you have to do. You're like, I have an alarm set for that. I'll be okay. I don't have to stress about it or worry about it. Mm. You're you're more open to these experiences, I guess. Yeah, that's an interesting point, um, yeah, because meditation is always about, you know, at least it starts with this, that, you know, you, you focus on the present moment. Exactly, yeah. So if you did that whilst in bed, you would probably be more prone to, to see these hypnagogic hallucinations, yeah. Yeah, it's actually very, very interesting. I've never, um, I've never, I've thought, never of thought about that. I've never thought about that. Me yeah. neither. <laughs> But I think it's worth uh, reflecting on more. Yeah. Mm. Okay, um, I've actually never done salvia, so it's I've never had an experience with salvia de Norm, and I actually don't know anyone. Well, I know Martin W. Ball. We've we've talked about it before um, on a, on the show. But um, when you say that you lost your sense of self, was it because it's different? Everyone I everyone I have seen talk about it always says it's different from the way that you would take. You know that it would be on mushrooms or mm. LSD or whatever. Is it is it disorienting or is it? Yeah, I mean it's um, it's very. I mean for a start, it's interesting because it acts on the brain in a in a completely different way to the most of the other classic hallucinogens, you know, psychedelics. Okay. So it's not. Um, I think the tryptamines generally act on the um the serotonin receptors, but this doesn't. It's it's a completely different um has a completely different effect on the brain, but yet the experience is somewhat similar. And that, you see, again, linking that to philosophy is very interesting in terms of mul- what is known as multiple realization. That, mm-hmm. um, you know, the same mental state can be realized through multiple, many different kinds of physical bases. So, like, for example, the classical one from um, Hilary Putnam is hunger. You know, like, a human can, can uh, experience hunger and that would be correlated to certain uh, human brain states, but um, an octopus can as well, right? Presumably, mm-hmm. it's more it's more likely that it can than that it can't. 
But of course, an octop two thirds of an octopus's brain exists in its arms, so and it's got a completely different brain. Um, mm -hmm. So that means that hunger can't be the same thing as this thing going on in the human brain. So that was an argument against what's known as the identity theory between the brain and the mind in the um, in the mid twentieth century. But you see, with salvia, it's quite interesting as well then, because you have somewhat similar psychedelic experiences with that, yet the brain correlate is very different, which again. Um, distinguishes the mind from the matter um, and there's a lot more there's a lot of research which should I think should be done into that you see the difference between salvia and the others um, but there were but like I said there were there was differences this complete la loss of self I mean the loss of self can occur on the tryptamines of as well of course you know the, the as the sort of cliche now you know you lose your ego your sense of self and yeah, become yeah. one with the universe now um, so that can happen, but I mean, I didn't. I, it wasn't like that for me in, with Salvia. I didn't lo become one with the universe. Like I said, I I entered this pink harbour town, you know. So, but I still didn't know who I was. I mean, even the word I doesn't really make sense, you know. You sort of identify with the town itself. Um, are, are you versed in shamanism at all? Is that something that's ever interested you? It does interest me. And actually, a few days ago, I met Julian Vane, who's a shaman, um, British shaman here, and uh, and Nikki Weird. Um, does interest me, but I it only interests me because I don't know much about it. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I think that's an interesting way to answer that. Um, as I mean, I, I guess how would I word this? Um, if you lose any sense of self, if there's this sort of strange, you're placed in a in a new environment or something of the like without any sense of ego. Why on earth would these experiences be valuable for uh, a shaman? Why would a shaman want someone to use these experiences? I've, I've heard a lot about uh, salvia being used in shamanic practice. Mm. Um, why would a shaman want someone to lose their sense of identity? Um, well, in this sense, it doesn't like like you mentioned. It's not the same as it is with other psychedelics. Mm, okay, right. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean that. I suppose generally you could say it might be a way of um, softening someone's concern about themselves, which might cause them anxiety or whatever, I suppose. But at the same time, I mean, the word shaman as well, of course, is a generic term, isn't it? And I imagine the shamans of uh, Siberia will differ very much from those of South America and so on. And yeah. both of them might have completely different purposes to their ceremonies and methods. I. Like I said, it's not really my field. I, I can't say. You can only speculate. Um, but generally speaking about the ego and so on, I mean, there's, you know, in the psychedelic community, it's, again, a platitude, isn't it, to say, you know, uh, we should drop yeah. the ego and uh, become one with <laughs> everything and so on and, uh, and whatnot. And I, you know, I, I'd like to, I sort of, uh, I suppose in my Nietzscheanism coming out now, you know, and his notion of the will to power, you know, which is sort yeah. of like the ego in a way. I mean, the ego or your sense of self and your pride in yourself is not a bad thing, really. I mean, all animals and plants seem to have it. At least they have it in group format. I yeah. mean, it helps people develop. I mean, it's. Um, I think it's part of nature, you know. And if you if you try to deny the ego or or pride in in, in work or whatever it is, you're sort of um, you're actually being anti natural. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm I'm all for the ego, really, you know, <laughs> and that's um, I, I think I differ from a lot of people in, in if you can call it a psychedelic community. I sort of. Yeah, I think I don't really fit in nicely. And um, that is something I've actually heard before. Um, I mean, I've, I've spoken with people about it before that, you know, the ego is, you know, yeah, it can be bad, but it, it can be good. I mean, it's the same. The ego is the same. The same drive that um, causes you to kill someone is the same drive that would cause you to make an Apple computer. Exactly. You know, or so it, I mean, I, I guess. And ultimately, really, I mean, for Nietzsche, the, the will to uh, survive is part of the will to power. So, you know, even your self survival is part of your ego, really. You know, mm -hmm. why would you want to deny that to people? Um, I think actually saying, telling people that they should lose their ego is a way of increasing your own, you know, because you put yourself yeah. on a pedestal and saying, listen, let me tell you people something. You all need to lose your egos and just follow me, like I have done, <laughs> something like this. I mean, it's it's hard to avoid, really. I mean, I think, ultimately, you can even reduce, well, it's an arguable thing, but you can reduce morality to ego, ultimately, or not ego so much as power, 
I mean, the the concept of ego is a very vague term anyway, you know. What yeah. does it really mean? How do you uh, define it physically or mentally even? It's it's an awkward term that's bandied about without real definition. So so I prefer the, the concept of will to power instead, which is, um, is more solid. And even if you are going to say, you know, ego, I think it should be stated with this. I think you should say, like, you know, the caveat of toxic ego, you know, um, yeah. the okay. ego that does you know, destroy countries or ruin economies or, yeah. um, you know, drain small villages of their water. Those types of, you know, egoic mm-hmm. pursuits are ones that maybe we should actually maybe say that there could be some rework in there. Yeah, um, I mean, interestingly, um, Schopenhauer d- uh, distinguishes um, altruism, you know, like care for others, from ego, which you care for yourself, from, at the other end, malice. So, you know, yeah. destroying, uh, destroying others, whatever, for for Schopenhauer, it's not even part of ego. It's it's a very rare thing, which is just a sort of desire to hurt others, um, even when it's not in your self-interest. I mean, it's an interesting question as to whether that really even exists, such malice, because most people think, you know, if, you, if you're hurting others, ultimately for your own sake, somehow, you know, like to gain profits or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, but maybe there is maybe there is this other drive of, of pure malice, you know, who knows? Okay. Well, we're actually, this is the perfect segue. I mean, while we're on the topic of, you know, just sort of ego and intent and all these other things, um, we don't, I don't feel like we hear enough academics actually talk about how psychedelics change their normal waking life. I mean, just the way that they watch TV, the way that they solve, you know, inter, interpersonal problems, uh, the ways that they, you know, view art now, mm. how has, what were you like before you actually had your first psychedelic experience, uh, psychologically, mentally, just as, as far as your temperament and emotionality goes up until now, or now that you're more experienced? Um, I suppose the first effect it had on me really was, and it sounds corny almost, but it, it opens your mind to, to more possibilities, you know? So like, for example, I'd, I'd always taught philosophy of religion with a sort of skeptical bias, I should say, you know? It's like, well, yeah. these people say they've seen this, but, you know, <laughs> it's impossible to prove and therefore. Um, but after taking that, you know, it didn't mean that I suddenly believed it all, but rather yeah. it made me realise that I was being far too narrow minded before and I didn't give credibility to things which <laughs> were probably perceived at least as, as being the case. And then, of course, then you realise the limitations of your former worldview. Um, yeah. So, so I had this general um, emancipating effect, I suppose. Um, I don't think it really changed my personality much, though. I, except for that, I mean, I, you know, it hasn't had a profound effect on me in that sense, not, not on a character okay. sense. No. It's um, I, I guess I wonder if you've had similar experiences, but you mentioned just being more open to the religion. I mean, it's uh. I guess I've always I've been more interested in uh, the East always growing up. I mean, I was always interested in Buddhism and shamanism and things like that. But I always saw them as philosophies and just things, I guess, to incorporate into your life and to improve it. I didn't see them as this sort of matter of fact, um, you know, it is this thing that the uh, that the Abrahamic religions tend to have. But even that, for some reason, I remember the first time I did LSC, man, it was so strange to sit to sit down and really see and be able to conceptualize a lot of these concepts in um, Christianity and Buddhism and Islam, all of these things. Like suddenly, certain things made sense. You know, it was it was the strangest thing. Like to see, like I remember one of the most vivid thoughts I had was, man, what if Jesus was just tripping hard? <laughs> you know, when he saw that burning bush, like what if somehow. He had just gotten a, gotten a hold of some of this stuff somehow. You know, ergot was not exactly rare around those times. There was famines and things like that. So I'm like, if Jesus was a real figure or whoever it is, the authors, what if the authors had just gotten a hold of some of this stuff? And maybe it's some huge parable for their psychedelic experiences. Well, I've, I've always thought that when you look at the book of Revelation, I mean, yeah. that is that is a psych, dark psychedelic trip, you know, mm-hmm. Um the seventh seal was opened and these horse <laughs> came flying <laughs> through the sky and then there was this throne surrounded by a rainbow circle. Can't remember the details now, but I mean, it's always been my favorite part of the Bible, despite its darkness. And, uh, and, um, I think, 
yeah, it'd be very interesting actually to be to take a high dose of psychedelics and then read that or have someone read it to you, you know. Well, it would probably be terrifying actually. But the question is, were they on it? I mean, I don't. You can, you can but speculate, but I mean these the, these chemicals have you know we're talking about the ancient Greeks, uh, which predates the New Testament at least. Um, you know they they were probably on it, and, and it wouldn't be surprising at all. But but of course the interesting thing is they would ha if they had these experiences, the question is how would they interpret them? How would they write them down? You know, and so you still have yeah. a cultural appropriation even if they were real. Did you um? Have you ever actually um, tried like any DMT? Have you ever experimented with that at all? Uh, not probably, no. No, I haven't. There's one thing okay. I need to uh, I need to properly do. I say properly. <laughs> I've taken a small dose, but it didn't have much of an effect. Oh, okay. Uh, you you just vaped it, or yeah, but um, yeah. Well, it just didn't work. Basically, <laughs> it didn't. I mean, I did it wrong. <laughs> Put it that way. Have you yeah, tried? Okay. Have you tried it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I haven't actually had the smoke time, but um, I, I have had a um, a type of ayahuasca. Uh, it's called pharmawasca, and it's uh, it, it's basically an, an MAOI, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, and then you combine that with the uh, a substance that has a high amount of DMT in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. How did that differ from my other experiences you had? It's it's not the same physically. Um, at, at first it was very strange because at first, the first, well, just to preface this, I took way too much. Um, I, I did the calculations wrong, the dosage wrong. So, so the, the complete opposite of me then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a complete, uh, way too much. So, um, because I had tried it before and I didn't break through, nothing happened. So I was just kind of like, okay, well maybe I should just double the dose. I should have actually maybe stepped it up uh, a half instead of a whole mm -hmm. dose, you know, instead of doubling it. And um, so for the first half of it, it was the most interesting psychedelic experience I've ever had. The visions were very vivid. They were very clear. Um, it, there wasn't a lot of open eyed visuals. It, it was mostly closed eyed. So you didn't see too much. There was some small fractalization, but most of the things that were going on was behind your eyes. You had to keep your eyes. If you kept your eyes closed, you saw all sorts of weird stuff. Like you'd see planets and portals and I got like this weird uh this ultra vivid it was like the most high depth image that you could think of it was almost like it, it was somebody standing right behind my eyes like I could see um the Buddha and it was like he was sitting he was sitting there and there's like this weird psychedelic stuff going on behind him and there's just planets and it, it was very interesting I mean and, that sounds like my uh, uh psilocybin uh, experiences really it sounds very similar um okay you know but I mean, they are both, of course, very similar molecules, so it's not surprising, really. But I do hear that some people say, you know, Lau, you haven't really, you know, you don't really know psychedelics unless you try DMT. Yeah. Uh, but I know, uh, I mean, I, I, a good friend of mine, the author, Simon G. Powell, Simon mm -hmm. G. Powell, yeah, he's tried both, and he says, for him, they're, they're, they're very similar as well, so. It's it's know. definitely, I, I've never seen uh, images so clearly. I mean, um, as far as the psychedelic experience goes, you know, for the first half, and that's actually not the greatest thing. I'll come back to that in a bit. But um, so at first it was just it was fantastic. I was seeing all the sort of interconnectedness um, of my life and just how I impacted certain people. It was very similar to LSD in that regard, but just different. Um, it was an, and mushrooms, too, to a lesser degree for me. I've, I've only actually experienced uh, experimented with psilocybin once and I didn't take a very high dose of it. Um, but it was very similar to LSD in that regard of, you know, you see this interconnectedness and all of these things are happening. And, but after a while, it started to get really, really, really dark. I mean, like super dark. Like it was, it was the darkest psychedelic trip I've ever had. You mean, and you mean metaphorically dark, you know, as in Gothic or something, or what do you mean? I, I mean, as Maleficent, you know, it's just, it's, it was just not good. <laughs> like, um... <laughs> I remember, um, and then you can't move because you're so disoriented from the uh, the substance itself, whatever. I'm not sure if it's the MAOI that's doing it or what, but you're so disoriented. I couldn't move. I was literally, you know, every time I would get up, I would stumble around and stagger. Um, so it got to the point where I was just in the fetal position, just kind of laying on the couch. It's like, I, I just had to kind of take it. If you will. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't sound good, no. 
yeah. I mean, I, I, this is, you see, this is what interests me the most, really, now. Uh, dark psychedelic um, episodes like that, you know. Yeah. Um, I remember reading in Strasman's book about a guy who uh, took DMT and then he just had a, he, he thought he was being raped by two crocodiles for two hours and that was it. You oh, know? It's, no. So, <laughs> sort of destroyed him i think yeah um but you know is it i think it's generally a very interesting question as to why it seems relatively common for people to have these nightmarish uh visions you know and when i say mm. nightmarish i mean i mean sort of like you know gothic like i said i saw the devil i saw i saw this sort of um gothic architecture as well and um iron crosses and skulls you know i remember the one one amazing thing i saw this uh wall of skulls and each skull was uh, sort of um, outlined by this luminous blue light, you know, <laughs> and it was very, very beautiful and and cool, but it was dark. And I just think to myself, why, why am I seeing that? Why is the mind, yeah. <laughs> or whatever it may be, if if there is a connection to something else, uh, like uh, this eternal realm or whatever I mentioned? I mean, what? Why is that given to me? I mean, I suppose ultimately it's it's a bit like the question of what nightmares. You know, why yeah. why do that to yourself? <laughs> you know, why yeah. scare the hell out of yourself? Um, what is it that makes man see these dark episodes? You know, it's a fascinating thing. And mm-hmm. there's this theologian called um, Rudolf Otto who writes about. He says the fear of God is really the origin of the concept of the holy you know yeah the idea of the holy and it's but that fear of god i mean it's literally a fear it's a trembling you know and he says the first instances of this um, divine feeling um can be witnessed in you know you know just ghost stories and uh and halloween and whatever you know this is the first calling of it because often this often like um horror films or whatever they're reduced to our primal fear from you know like a wild animals when we lived in caves or whatever yeah but i think there's there seems to be this kind of dread that we can experience which the psychedelic experience can fully bring out more than a nightmare even um mm. it can fully bring out this real sort of metaphysical dread you know something which is goes beyond the fear of wolves or bears whatever it may be um and uh, this also is linked to these old notions, philosophical notions of, uh, for example, the sublime. You know, Edmund Burke spoke yeah. about it, Kant, Schopenhauer. It was a big thing 200 years ago, This all this talk about the sublime. And part of that sublime was terror, this feeling mm-hmm. like absolute terror in front of this vast power. Um, so, again, there's something else to explore there with psychedelics. You know, it gives you this can give you this utter sense of the sublime you know and um i mean normally the sublime is invoked by looking at the great ocean or the starry heavens or something like this mm-hmm. but you get a comp- you can get a completely different version of what is still the same ultimately the same feeling i think which is of the sublime on psychedelics mm-hmm. so having experienced that then going back to Kant, going back to burke and so on you know will give you a whole new, fresh perspective on these old philosophical questions it's it's extremely interesting i mean um it i guess it would it, it would make sense i mean that there would have to be if, if these things if these substances truly are about expanding consciousness and uh gaining information and you know evolving yourself spiritually and or mentally or whatever you would have to understand from a certain perspective the other side if you as you mentioned you know the nightmarish side of it the dark side i mean i've had um I've had the motivational trips, you know, where it's kind of telling you like, hey, okay, well, you can be doing this better in your life. Maybe you should, you know, be more caring or maybe you should be more, you know, I've had those episodes during certain trips, which which are fine for the most part. But this was something entirely different. I mean, it was I had before that I had never had um, any gothic experiences or anything of that sort. Never. I'd never seen anything um, negative as I was, as, as you, you know, depending on who would define it. Mm. Um, but this one was, yeah, man, it was war and famine and death and destruction. And it, it was, hmm. it was just weird. It was very strange. Well, that's all part of, you know, human reality as well, isn't it? War, famine and whatever. Yeah. So, you know, that I think, um, I mean, there's another thing about psychedelic, 
what you might call psychedelic culture today, it does sugarcoat this somewhat, you know, because it has to, because, you know, psychedelics have got such a bad reputation through uh, misinformation, you know, it's from the yeah. war on drugs and whatever, that you have to sort of push the, you know, push the pendulum to the other side to, to make up for that. But having said that, to be perfectly honest, as we're saying, there is this incredible dark side there, which... I think for certain people brought up in a certain way could be very, very damaging. Um, but for me, for example, I have these dark trips and I want to have them again. You know, they're just sort of uh, fascinating. But that's me, you know. Uh, and you've only had that that one or have you had several? Oh, no, several, several. Quite common, common. I mean, even my hypnagogic hallucinations are quite dark, really. You know? Really? Yeah, I mean, like I was just saying this actually to uh, some people the other day that um, I've always had these um, hallucinations, but I, uh, I thought they were, I thought everyone had them. I, I've subsequently read that half half of people have them. I'd, but anyway, um, they are common. But I've always looked at them in interest, you know. Um, but in the last half year or so, sometimes I see these kind of uh, you know faces um, looking at me, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. But in the last half year or so, these faces have sort of uh, become very demonic goblin like you know evil but also uh -huh. very very intelligent seeming mm -hmm. um looking faces and uh they're sort of steps you know there was one point where one this sort of <laughs> face sort of stared at me and then i for the first time ever i i got slightly scared of that you know sort of oh, okay. had a slight fear inducing effect which is odd but um i don't know what that might be because i'm you know, I'm not sleeping as well as I have been because I've got two young children now, you know, so maybe that has an effect <laughs> on it. You know, who knows? It, I mean, uh, this is kind of strange, but I mean, you've never, they've never, you've never heard them speak or anything, have you? It's just always been just visual? Purely visual, yeah, thus far. But I was speaking to a, an old friend of mine from school at this, um, I hadn't met for 20 years at this party a few months ago. And he yeah. told me, he's a very scientific guy, he does like blood samples at hospital or something like this. Anyway, mm -hmm. he was telling me that how he suffered from incubus all his life, um, Ooh, okay. which, which is like, if you don't know, it's, uh, you know, like a goblin or a demon is on your chest. But he was telling mm -hmm. me how, you know, he, he wakes up in, in paralysis, you know, sleep paralysis. And he's, yeah. he's almost you know, very regularly and he sees this thing, um, you know, jumping around his room or whatever, you know. And uh, again, this is another aspect of the of the sort of dark I wouldn't call it psychedelic, of course, but it's part of the dark side of our minds, you know. And it is interesting, I mean, because it does give credence to these figures that you see in, you know, mythology, in Eastern, in, in any sort of mythology, religious or just, yeah. art, you know, any sort of mythology, when you see these type of creatures for yourself. I mean, and I wonder how much of us already consuming those images for our entire lives actually plays into the manifestation of them. Like, you know, if you're if you're watching movies all the time, if you're watching this stuff all the time, well, it would make sense that you may see a fairy if you watch yeah. high fantasy all the time. I mean, yes. If you're watching Lord of the Rings all the time, I mean, I guess it would make sense that you'd see elves. Yeah. But, but it that is very. It's a chicken egg question, isn't it? Because, you know, yeah. as you're intimating, you know, um, do we have films about fairies and elves? Because we've had experiences of them in the past, which then have led to the fairy tales and whatnot, you know, which then feed into the films. I mean, like, for example, there's a lot of talk about elves now, seeing sheen elves and whatever. Terence McKenna spoke about it. Yeah. And then yeah. I think, well, you know, people who have read all the literature, Terence McKenna, and they're expecting to see elves, and then they take mushrooms, and then they see elves, you know, it's not surprising. But when you look into the history, actually, it's very common throughout the history of, um, you know, even in the 50s, people were talking about elves and LSD. So, you know, maybe there's, it's a, a fa again, another fascin fascinating phenomenon, seeing Lilliputians, you know, little people. Like, why yeah. is that so common? <laughs> is it to do with maybe our toys? You know, like most toys are little mini versions of figures, dolls and puppets and whatnot. Perhaps, again, something to do research into. That's, that's actually very, very interesting. Um, I mean, I, I guess... I, I try not to get too, you know, out there with this type of stuff, but I mean, it is, it's just fascinating when you see, you know, people talking about this, like in shamanism, they say these, you know, they speak a lot of realms and dimensions and, and that these things reside in these differing levels of consciousness, that they reside in these sort of different dimensional planes. Mm -hmm. And then you can sort of run into them when you're on these substances. That's why they, you know, champion these experiences so much. 
And again, I mean, it is weird to see this this stuff as described in ancient lore and in all this mm. other stuff. It is. I mean, um, again, as to the veridicality of these things, I'm going to stay agnostic. But um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm not ruling it out. I mean, related to um, related to these things, there's of course the issue of wishful thinking. You know, a lot of people would yeah. wish that fairies. I mean, where I live in Cornwall, southwest Britain, there's a lot of neo pagans. And there are a lot of people who actually literally believe in fairies and elves, you know, literally, um, including Brian Froud, who did like uh, the illustrations and the puppets for the Labyrinth movie and so on. Um, there are real believers in that. So but it's very easy to think, ah, well, yeah, you know, just like people who Christians who believe in heaven, they just want, like Freud said, you know, like um, it's just wishful thinking. You want to live forever and you want your enemies punished and you want a purpose in life and whatever. <laughs> easy. Make this yeah. stuff up. OK, yeah, fair enough. But, you know, that cuts both ways. Uh, John Hick, the theologian, wrote this against Freud. He said, you know, um, there's a solace in believing that when you die, that's it. You know, yeah. and an interesting thing related to these the talk, talk of all these dark matters is that there's a solace in believing that it's all due to brain malfunction. Uh, because if you believe that, then you don't have to worry about it as a real thing. I mean, like, for example, Incubus, like, oh, yeah, some brain uh, mess up you know uh, that explains it and therefore you can enjoy it and not not fear it at all but of course regardless of the truth one way or the other that is still wishful thinking of course in its own in itself have you actually ever experienced sleep paralysis before yourself uh, once once in my life yeah i was um i was in my early 20s and a uh, student and i had I had drunk maybe a beer more than i should have and um, <laughs> i uh, i woke up a few hours later, and I just couldn't move. It was terrifying, actually. I, I just could not move, but I was fully conscious. And um, it, luckily, it only lasted about 20 seconds or so. But uh, I know, I've got another friend who has it, like, every week, you know, but you, you, I guess you get used to it. I think it's because, you know, in deep sleep, your your um, your body sort of, um, your brain shuts, shuts off to your body so you don't hurt yourself. And when you wake up, it reconnects. But then in sleep paralysis, obviously, that doesn't occur. And you didn't see anything during that? No, no, thank God. No. <laughs> okay. I didn't. Yeah, I mean, it happened to me too, like, um, same, around the same age. Uh, I think I was maybe like 19, 20. I'm 24 now. So it was, I was like, I don't think I was drinking. I don't think I had anything to drink. Um, But I remember just being faced, I was facing the wall. But when I woke up, I just couldn't, I couldn't move. And there was, I felt like there was a presence behind me, but I didn't see, I couldn't see anything since I was facing the wall, but it did feel like there was something in the room. Mm. Um, it is very, very, very odd <laughs> just, to, just to not be able to move. Was it and, um, it, and I guess in any way to that dark experience you had? I mean, it doesn't sound as bad as that. No, 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 not even close. And how long did it last? <laughs> did you um, say? Maybe 10 seconds. Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, could be worse. So it, it is. It's very, very strange. I mean, I, that's why I often wonder what is going on in these sort of in-between spaces of where you're kind of conscious and you're kind of not. You know, you're you're here, but you're not. You know. Yeah, I mean, was, I think all of this really <laughs> comes back to um, you know, what the mind-matter relationship is really, and uh, that yeah. is one of the biggest mysteries of you know science biology psychology philosophy you know it's it's a big unknown despite the fact that a lot of people think oh yeah no we've we worked that out 20 years ago um no one agrees on anything i, I once gave a talk at the um towards the science of uh, consciousness conference 2011 in mm -hmm. stockholm uh on schopenhauer it was but um i remember everyone had their own theory about this um and everyone was completely different in their theories and everyone was really angry about every, everything else you know but everyone thought obviously everyone else was wrong it was crazy what they thought however they had got the answer um so we're still yeah i mean we're still searching for that answer i mean like some people colin mcginn for example william james they think we will never reach that stage as humans um of answering that that question as to the relation of mind and matter I'm, I'm more optimistic, but the the question of the veridicality of psychedelics is linked to that question, you know, it sort of goes hand yeah. in hand. I remember David Nutt, he said, um, after these LSD uh, brain, this, this, this research on the um, scanning the brain whilst on LSD, he said, if you want to understand consciousness, you've got to look at psychedelics. 
Yeah. Uh, he's you know, a professor of Imperial College and so on. I mean, it, I think this, again, it just shows the value that psychedelics can provide our notions of of consciousness, which really is the most fundamental aspect of reality for us. Okay, um, let's talk about, um, we're going to talk about one more thing and then we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, you, you've heard about the, the microdosing trend in Silicon Valley, right? Yes. Okay, now that we're talking about uh, consciousness and just the sort of expansion of it, um, I guess in a more grounded context, um, how does, have, first off, have you ever microdosed? Is this? Um, no, I haven't actually. I've, okay. t- I've, t- um, I've tried um, um, modafinil, you know, these sort of... Uh, see, I've never tried that either. Yeah. But I, no, I've never microdosed with psychedelics. I know people who have. <laughs> Okay, and, and typically, what do they say of their experiences when they do it? Well, you know, it makes them more productive. Um, they're more creative. They can, uh, you know, think of um, new ideas for their workplace and mm-hmm. whatnot, and it alleviates their bad moods or depression or whatever, you know. Um, and it can even be a painkiller, you know. It seems to some. The, yeah, I, I suppose the, the issue I have have with it is that it lacks sort of clinical research. So one wonders whether oh, yeah. it really has an effect, a direct effect, or whether it's a placebo effect, you know, mm-hmm. uh, which is fine. You know, the placebo effect is an effect; it works. But I want, you know, I would like to see research done into to, to decipher that question. I, I guess for me, the reason why it stood out to me so much when I first heard it—I mean, because this is not something that's new—but it's it's very interesting to see that it's uh, beginning to become more mainstream. I think it sort of hints at the potentiality of integrating these substances into normal society, the way that they can be applied in normal society. Because typically we hear about these substances used in, you know, an academic context, or it's usually either academic partying or um, the spiritualist community. You never really hear too much about the working guy who's like, oh, I like to, you know, take a little bit of mushrooms or or uh, LSD or whatever and mm-hmm. still go to work or still, you know, be normal. So I think, I, I think this wave, if the research... Uh, pans out to be um, that this isn't yeah. you know too bad for you know if it isn't too detrimental to your yeah. health. Um, I think this could actually be a very important step in uh, shedding some positive light on these substances. Yeah, it could be. I mean, it's very interesting that um, the demographic where that changes radically as well, isn't it? So before psychedelics yeah. have traditionally been part of this sort of a so-called hippie demographic, again a vague term, whatever. But then, yeah, microdosing seems to be fitting into a capitalist structure. And helping that capitalist structure come up with great new ideas in order to make profit and to increase technology and so on, you know, um, is that a step? So that, yeah, certainly I agree. That's a step in the direction of mainstream acceptance mm-hmm. of these substances. I suppose the ultimate question is: Is that to be desired? I know some people are against that. Um, it depends ultimately on your on your worldview, I suppose, what the ultimate purpose of society mm-hmm. is, and so on. And see, that's actually interesting that you mentioned that. Um, a lot of people that I've seen that do talk about microdosing, though, on the on the flip side, they almost always say that they take it for. I had actually never even heard anyone say that they've done it for pain relief, like you said earlier. It's it's almost always for um, just business, at least in the Silicon Valley uh, mm-hmm. sect that I've seen. It's always for, you know, oh, let's figure out a way to be more productive. Let's figure out a way to, to come up with faster ideas and be faster and be better. It, it, does, that, does that have dangerous implications at all, in your opinion? I suppose if you – I mean, I, I always – I try as much as possible to remain apolitical, you know, without taking yeah, sides okay. uh, because it interferes with philosophy a lot. But I um, – so being objective, I'd say if you're, if you're more left-leaning, socialist-leaning, then I think you'd be against it, really, because um, it's an it's a tool for the capitalist system of expansion, you know, in one sense, mm-hmm. you could look like that. At the same time, you could be an accelerationist, which is uh, ultimately left, so you just want the capitalist system to blow up, so you just accelerate its demise by letting it do what it needs to do, you know, so in that sense, you'd be for it. Um, if you're a capitalist, of course, well, here's the funny thing. So if you're traditionally right wing, again, a term that doesn't really make sense anymore, but if you're more <laughs> center right, let's say, you know, conservative, we would say here, or Republican, maybe in America, um, yeah. 
if it turns out that microdosing is safe and is efficient in terms of production, so in terms of profitability and technological advancement, mm -hmm. then I suppose a libertarian conservative certainly would be for it, I see. But of course, at the same time, on the right, you generally have a, a sort of um, an antagonism towards drugs. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know how that would pan out, you know, it would involve a sort of a change of a view change either way. Okay. But and it's, I mean, it's, it's uh, interesting how what will actually happen with this. I suspect, you know, there'll be a legalized or decriminalization of, of many psychedelic drugs in the Western world within 20 years, I, I expect. But who knows? You know, one thing could change all of that quite easily. Okay. And, and despite, I mean, you typically remaining apolitical, do you actually think that these substances, are you of that camp that actually believes that these substances can do anything to change politics at all from, from the inside? You know, changing the politician's mindset about uh, the way that they view the world or the way that they view the political process? I'm skeptical about that. I mean, I, I um, okay. recently interviewed Tim Scully, who was the uh, LSD chemist yeah. and uh, made the Orange Sunshine LSD in the 60s. I mean, he, he believed that originally, and that's why he made the stuff. But then he was disheartened when he realized that even the people who were these pacifists and spreading the good news, as it were, um, <laughs> they, they became, you know, nothing really worked for them. And they sort of fought amongst themselves. And then it, the whole thing became a disillusionment. And um, yeah. and then he saw he saw his sort of enthusiasm for that thought that, you know, LST can change the world and we'll have a revolution and so on. He, he saw that in line with all of the other religions, all the other religious cults, whatever, who thought what they were doing is vital to world peace and whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. um, also, I'll say this, and this is related to my work in nihilism a bit more. Um, certain thinkers like... Um, Octavia Paz and Ernst Jünger and so on, um, mm -hmm. they they took psychedelics and not only did it dissipate their notions of social structure and that, you know, that there should be this hierarchy and whatever, which is common, but it also mm -hmm. um, disintegrated their notions of morality, you know. In other words, they became more meta-ethical, you know. They thought, well, you know, in this culture we believe this is right and this is wrong, in another culture something else and so on. And yeah. um, and so it can do that. Now, if it does that to you, so psychedelics can um, do that to you as well, it seems, or at least it can solidify your views if you already have them. So I don't. I, I would be very um, hesitant to say that psychedelics will lead will lead a certain certain group of people, a politician, whatever, to a certain viewpoint. I think it can have mm -hmm. vastly different effects on different people. Okay. Okay. Well, um, could you give us uh, tell us some information about some uh, upcoming things that you have going on? What do you, do you have any new books or anything coming out? Um, no, I no new books. I mean, Numenautics is my book. Numenautics is now in its okay. uh, second printing. Um, you can get that from the Psychedelic Press website or okay. Amazon or whatever. Um, I I suppose the big thing really is that I'm. I'm chairing the philosophy and psychedelics session at uh, Europe's largest psychedelic conference, Breaking Convention. Okay. So uh, that's happening at the end of June, beginning of July this year in London. That should be exciting. Um, otherwise, I'm sort of uh, pursuing my PhD. I'm sort of, you know, it's very time consuming. So, mm -hmm. so I'm doing a lot of reading and writing on that. Um, got a number of talks coming up here and there. I'm doing a talk in Penzance on writing skills and and so on in April, and a uh, number of other, got a number of interviews coming up. Um, I've got a news, I've got a new thing actually, which will tell if there people are interested, will tell people about this. It's a news, new newsletter, um, okay. which they can find on the on my homepage, which is uh, www.philosopher.eu. Okay. So if you sign up to that, you'll get all the latest stuff. I post a newsletter now every two weeks or so. Okay. Um, and all the links to that stuff will be in the description box, guys. So if you want to check that out, then you will be free to do so. Just click that down below. And um, all right. So I think that'll do it for today, man. It was it was fantastic talking to you, Peter, man. Really fun. Really interesting for me. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, guys. That'll do it for us today. Prox out.